Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Kamran Rastegar, and I'm the director of the Center for the Human Humanities at Tufts, as well as a professor jointly appointed in the Department of International and Literary and Cultural Studies and the Department for Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora. It's my privilege to welcome you virtually to tonight's Solomon Speaker Series event with prominent uh, political commentator, editor, and professor Peter Beinart for a talk on anti-Semitism, US-Israel relations, and the moral responsibilities of power. Tonight's event is jointly hosted by the Center for Humanities and the Tisch College of Civic Life as the second event of the year-long series on anti-Semitism. Uh, along with other forms of racism, anti-Semitism has disturbingly been on the rise, and this series seeks to shed light on this question, both on the Tufts campus and beyond, and to devise responses that combat anti-Semitism alongside other forms of hatred, such as Islamophobia, anti-Black racism, or hatreds predicated on other forms of perceived difference. We dedicated, I'm sorry, we uh, kicked off the series just two days ago with Polish Holocaust historian and professor Jan Grabowski, who spoke about his current legal battle with the Polish authorities over his findings in his critically acclaimed book that reveal a Polish village official who gave up Jewish re residence to the Nazi regime. In an ongoing effort to exonerate the Polish nation of any role in the murders of Polish Jews during the Nazi occupation, the Polish government has found Professor Grabowski guilty of defamation and ordered him to apologize, which he has appealed all the way to the highest court. Professor Grabowski's story is remarkable, and I encourage you to watch the full event recording, which is available on Tisch College's YouTube channel. What strikes me about Professor Grabowski's story and tonight's topic is the common theme of power. And as Mr. Beinart will explore in his talk, the moral responsibilities that come with power. Whereas Professor Grabowski's work is more about how we grapple with the past, today's conversation with Mr. Beinart is about what kind of future there will be for Israel for, and what America's role may be for that future, and how the specter of anti-Semitism haunts those questions. Power, both individual and collective, is central to both discussions. Before I introduce tonight's guests, I want to thank our generous co-sponsors, the School of Arts and Sciences at Tufts, and in particular, Dean Jim Glazer, the Judaic Studies Program, Middle Eastern Studies Program, and the Forest Center for Eastern Mediterranean Studies for their support and collaboration. For folks in the Zoom room, please submit your questions uh, at, for our speakers at any time during the event via the Q&A icon that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen, rather than posting them in the chat. We will do our best to get, a, uh, get to as many as possible of the questions during the Q&A portion of this event. Mr. Uh, Peter Beinart is Professor of Journalism and Political Science at the City University of New York. He's a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times, a CNN political commentator, and editor at large of Jewish Currents, and is a non resident fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. He writes the Beinart Notebook newsletter on Substack, and his first book, The Good Fight, was published by HarperCollins in 2006, and his second book, The Icarus Sy Syndrome, was published by HarperCollins in tw uh, 2010. His third book, The Crisis of Zionism, was published by Times Book in 2012. Beinart has written for The Atlantic, The Wall Street Journal, The New Republic, The Financial Times, Boston Globe, Newsweek, Slate, The Forward, Reader's Digest, uh, Die Zeit, Frankfurter Allemeine Zeitung, uh, Polity, uh, and uh, The Week magazine named him as columnist of the year in 2004. In 2005, he gave the Th Theodore H. White lecture at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Beinart graduated from Yale University, winning a Rhodes Scholarship for graduate study at Oxford University. And after graduating from Oxford, uh, Beinart went on to become the New Republic's managing editor in 1995. He became senior editor in 1997, and from 1999 to 2006 served as the magazine's editor. In subsequent years, Beinart has, Beinart has gone on to focus his attention, uh, among other topics, to the situation on, in Israel and Palestine. Uh, earlier on by editing a page on the Daily Beast that was dedicated to the issue. And over the last decade, he's come to occupy a very prominent space in public discourse on the conflict. He's most recently published pieces in Jewish Currents and in the New York Times, outlining an argument for moving away for, from a two-state solution. Um, in, the, in the US, anti-Semitism has, ex has experienced a rise along with other forms of racism, primary among them black racism, Anti-Semitism uh, 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 anti is all, uh, sometimes invoked in discussions about the past, present, and future of Israel in characterizations of criticism that is made of Israel, 
in com the conversation today may help us to clarify and distill the heinous history of an ongoing threat posed by the circulation of anti-Semitic ideas, while also clarifying the terms of what should be acceptable in posing crit critical questions about the state of Israel and what is not. Joining Mr. Beinart in conversation tonight is Professor Peter Levine, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Tisch College and the Lincoln Filing Professor of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Professor Levine is the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm just repeating myself. Trained as a moral and political philosopher, Professor Levine has spent most of his career conducting applied empirical research and organizing professional efforts related to civic life in the United States including sustained work on civic education, voting rights, public deliberation, social movements, and the measurement of social capital. Levine is the author of eight books, including most recently, We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For, The Promise of Civic Renewal in America, published by Oxford University Press in 2013, and the forthcoming What Should We Do? Political Theory with Citizens at the Center, also with Oxford University Press. He served on the boards or steering committees of such civic organizations as America Speaks, Street Law Inc., the Newspaper Association of America Foundation, the Campaign for Civic Missions of Schools, Discovering Justice, the Charles F. Kettering Foundation, American Bar Association Committees, uh, American Bar Association Committees, uh, uh, Committee for Public Education, the Paul Eicher uh, Foundation, and the Deliberate uh, Democracy Consortium. So uh, before we begin, a brief word about our format. We will begin with my colleague, Peter Levine, posing questions uh, of our guest, uh, Peter Beinart, which should take up about 45 minutes of our time. Then we will be uh, posing questions that have been sent in by audience members for the remaining period uh, of our time together. I'm looking very forward to what promises to be an engaging conversation. Thank you. Peter Levine, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Cameron. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to this conversation. Thank you, Cameron, for introducing us and for organizing it. And thanks, Peter, for joining us at Tufts. It's a little strange that we're sitting in two different rooms at Tufts with different Zoom cameras, um, but it works and, and we're glad it allows us a lot of people to join us. So um, and looking forward to the conversation. Um, so, you know, let's start with really the question that Cameron uh, kind of hinted at, but I'll just I'll just uh, specify a little bit and say um, Cameron himself said that there's rising anti-Semitism. Um, in the world. There are also a lot of people think uh, is rising criticism and broadening criticism of Israel. Um, so my question is about how those two things might or might not go together for in your in your opinion. First of all, is it true? Do you think there's rising um, anti-Semitism, rising criticism of Israel? And then are they related? Is one the cause of the other? Are they totally separate? So that's that's where we should start. Ooh, you thank, you. thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Just thank you so much for having me. I am um, um, uh, it's been a really a pleasure. I have gotten to spend the day at Tufts, which has been really interesting, enlightening experience. Um, and um, I also want to say this conversation, as I know from personal experience, this topic of Israel, Palestine, and anti-Semitism is um, is a really, really intimate and painful one. And I I suspect there will be people on this call who who strongly disagree with some of the things that I I, I say. Um, uh, I want to reassure you, you're in good company. There are many in my own my own family, my own synagogue who disagree with some of what I say. And I also wanna, if you're one of the people who disagrees with me, I wanna thank you for being on this call because I think that one of the most biggest problems that we face in the conversation on this topic in particular and more generally is this tendency to only listen to people who already disagree with you. One of my favorite lines from, from, from Pirkei Avot in the Mishnah is, is the line, who is wise, the one who learns from all people. So you are setting an example for all of us. If you're, the more frustrated you are about what I say, the more grateful I am that you're on this webinar. Um, the question of these two questions of is anti-Semitism rising and is criticism or condemnation of Israel rising are both tricky empirically. Um, it's tricky empirically to measure um, anti-Semitism for a number of reasons. First of all, I think the FBI data in the United States on hate crimes is not always that reliable in general, whether it has to do with Jews or, or other groups for various methodological reasons. Secondly, there isn't, uh, and this is probably something we'll talk about more, there isn't really a consensus definition of anti-Semitism, um, I think, um, between people who, are, who share different views, particularly on the Israel-Palestine conflict. So, for instance, American, uh, most of the most important American Jewish organizations, like 
APAC or the Anti-Defamation League would say that denying Israel's, saying that Israel should not be a Jewish state is anti-Semitic or maybe supporting the boycott of Israel uh, is, is anti-Semitic or calling Israel an apartheid state is anti-Semitic. If I don't happen to believe those things, if you believe those things, you will naturally see more anti-Semitism than someone who doesn't believe those things. Um, that said, I think that even with a, a narrower definition of anti-Semitism, the one that I would feel more comfortable, which is kind of hostility, discrimination, or even violence against Jews as Jews, qua Jews, um, I think that it is probably likely that it is increasing. Um, and I think that there are various different reasons for that. One of them is, um, is the rise of white nationalism more generally. We certainly, I think, with Donald, the influence of Donald Trump, um, have seen a rise in a, in a kind of new legitimacy or respectability to to openly white nationalist politics. And anti-Semitism plays a certain role in that. And I think you can understand the particular role that anti-Semitism plays in white nationalist politics by looking in particular at this, at, at the event in 2019, this, the massacre at the, at the synagogue in Squirrel Hill in, 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 in Pittsburgh. Um, so what ha you see the interrelatedness of these things. This, the guy who ended up shooting those people at the synagogue was initially upset because he had become convinced that the United States was being invaded by caravans of migrants of people coming from Central America. But because he was a bigot, he found it difficult to imagine that these people from Central and Latin America who he feared were gonna invade the United States had the capacity to organize themselves for an invasion. So he looked to, to Jews to help him understand this story because the stereotype of Jews historically has been different. It's of kind of the sinister genius with the hidden hand. You know, Oftentimes people talk about George Soros in these terms, they used to talk about you know, um, the Rothschilds in these terms. And so when, and you, you saw this also during the civil rights movement, when people who were, because they were racist, they didn't believe that black Americans could organize themselves. They thought the Jewish communists must be behind the civil rights movement. So as we've had this growing fear of people who fear that the United States is going to be, uh, is undergoing this demographic racial change that they oppose uh, because the country is becoming less white, oftentimes those people will seize on Jews and anti-Semitism as part of that story. And again, this has happened in other places as well. And I think that's part of the reason that we see uh, some rising in anti-Semitism um, uh, among white nationalists. Um, there's another kind of anti-Semitism, which I think, uh, again, is not new, but has, re I think, re-emerged, which tends to emerge, I think, in situations of class conflict. Um, if, you go back, uh, uh, if you go back, for instance, to all the way back to the Ocean Hill Brownsville teacher strike in New York in, 19, in the late 1960s or the Crown Heights riot in the early 1980s, that, and you see some of the recent incidents that have taken place, some of the uh, what uh, really unfortunate attacks, particularly on Haredi or ultra-Orthodox Jews in neighborhoods in New York and in the New York area, there seems to be an element here of um, a way in which class conflict in 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 communities that are that are um, that have in which there are in which there are Jews particularly ultra orthodox Jews and also other communities that cause conflict unfortunately turns in to anti-semitism or can can become a fuel for anti-semitism so that's a second um, kind of kind of anti-semitism the third which was your question about is is about the relationship to Israel Palestine there does seem to be some empirical evidence. Um, there's a political scientist at, you know, in Texas named Ayal Feinberg who's looked into this, that when there are, when there are, when the Israeli military, um, uh, when the number of casualties commit, uh, uh, committed by the Israeli military, the number of people killed or wounded by the Israeli military goes up, there is a, there is a car, you can see a spike in reported anti-Semitic incidents. So, violence, particularly by the Israeli military, does seem to correspond to increasing incidents of anti-Semitism. And there's also some data from Belgium and Australia, which seems to suggest that as well. Now, I don't think we know, one has to kind of hypothesize a little bit about what's going on here, but I think one possible theory of what's happening here is that people see things Israel is doing they don't like, and then they take that out on Jews um, um, uh, because they fail to make Tragically, they fail to make this distinction, and they take it out by defacing a, a synagogue or a, or you know yelling something at a Jewish. And there and there were incidents this spring during the war 
between Israel and Gaza, where we saw things that looked like that. People who seemed to be involved in Palestinian freedom efforts who then seem, uh, were committing acts of, of violence or harassment against, against Jews. So um, in terms of, uh, so that's an ex example where there is a relationship um, between um, a, a very unfortunate kind of, of response to the Israel-Palestine conflict and, uh, and, and harassment or attacks on Jews. Um, and, um, and so there, there is one way in which there is a really clear relationship. Um, there's also, to go back to this question of how you define anti-Semitism, there's also a broader critique which says the anti-Semitism is not simply um, you know, somebody who goes up and, and you know, beats up a Jew or yells, you know, or, you know, something at Jews or, or, you know, writes a swastika, but, but the very act of condemnation itself crosses the line into anti-Semitism. And I think there, again, one can't really think that through without you run up against this baseline question, what do we consider anti-Semitism and what don't we consider anti-Semitism? If you say, um, and so my view would be, um, if you say, if you um, say that, Israeli Jews do not have the right to live in Israel, Palestine uh, in, with, with equal rights and with safety, that seems to me you've crossed the line into anti-Semitism. Or of course, if you, you know, if you were to use, if you were to, um, but if you say that um, you don't believe in uh, the existence of Israel as a Jewish state, because you want it to be a state with equality under the law in which Jews and Palestinians are treated equally, um, and both Palestinians and Jews can live with basic rights and with safety. That does not, the, I do not believe that is anti-Semitic. Now, again, the main, main, the most, I would say, most prominent American Jewish organizations do, and we can talk about why they do, but I think that that is in some ways a lot of where the, the critical conversation needs to take place in thinking through what actually is, is a fair definition of anti-Semitism and, and what is not. Great, thank you, I'm glad you, so you, you did draw a line there in a pretty clear way and, and people may wanna challenge you or just ask more about that. So let's move to kind of a related topic, which is the value of, of or lack of value, the risks of a dialogue about these issues at a place like Tufts. So we're, uh, I think it's a fact, we're divided, a community that's divided on Israel-Palestine. Um, yeah. And one thing that a university might do is try to facilitate dialogue about those issues. And, and it would, I think the normal assumption would be that we should do so in a neutral or, or um, uh, impartial way. And um, actually, I like that idea, but I'm, I'm wondering what you think about it. So should we do that? Why should we do it? I mean, what, we're not going to solve Middle East peace by having a dialogue at Tufts. We're not going to actually solve the Middle East peace conflict. So um, what are we trying to do? Why should we do that? And are there, are there drawbacks or risks um, or reasons we shouldn't do it? Um, the risks are that, um, um, as I think with any dialogue on a, on a highly contentious issue, that people may come, be, may feel, come away feeling hurt or, or um, offended or upset. But I think it's a, worth, uh, uh, you know, a risk worth taking. I think the, the alternative, the costs of the alternative, which is that people stay in their silos and they don't have these conversations, I think are much higher. Um, I think that um, one of the things that, um, has it struck me talking to some people today at Tufts that was, I would say very poignant was the way in which I felt like people on both sides of this issue and, and people on both sides of the, you know, a Jew, both Jews and Palestinians feel um, a sense of not always being, of, 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 um, of, of great anxiety um, about, 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 um, about the possibility that they um, may not be treated with respect. And I think that seems to me the only way to try to make progress on this is actually for people to listen to one another and talk to one another. I think that in, um, I think that, you know, in um, many, the, the organized, one of my criticisms of the organized American Jewish community and of Jewish institutions, um, synagogues, Jewish schools, um, Jewish community centers, is that rarely do they bring in Palestinian speakers uh, or assign books or films by Palestinians. And as a result, it's very common for American Jewish kids to go to be raised in the Jewish community and not really have much exposure at all to Palestinian perspectives. And I think we really in the, and I, I, you know, I say this as someone who lives my life it, deeply in the Jewish community. I think we do our kids a disservice because we don't, because if, if their first exposure to, to the Palestinian experience is at university. Um, 
I think it makes it harder for those kids often because they haven't heard those things before. And I think that the the experience of inter, of Palestinian anger, you know, the anger which which generally comes from the lived experience of Palestinian students and others who are whose family members uh, or they themselves are living without basic rights is very, very, can be very, very challenging and painful for Jewish students. But I think it's more painful and more challenging because the Jewish community itself has kept them in a kind of a, an ideological bubble um, uh, really up until the time that they reached the age of 18. Um, but I also think um, it's not only one way. I think it's really important for um, Palestinian and pro-Palestinian uh, activists and, and students to hear from Zionist Jewish students. I, again, I am, um, my views are, are idiosync, are somewhat, are, are somewhat unusual. I consider myself a cultural Zionist um, because I believe in this, in the importance of a Jewish community, a Jewish society in Israel, Palestine, but I do not believe in a Jewish state. I believe in one equal state and we could talk about that later, but it's, it's important, I think, for people to understand the, 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 the experience that, that leads many, many Jews, most American Jews, not all, but most American Jews, to believe in the importance of a Jewish state. Um, it's important to try to understand, even if you don't buy it, even if you believe that Israel is a settler colonial, uh, a, a, a settler colonial state, it's important to understand that from inside the Jewish experience, as it, not as experienced by many, many, many um, American and even more in some ways non-American Jews, Jews who come from more fragile diaspora communities, that's not the way it's experienced. The way it's experienced is as the fulfillment of a deep, deep historic longing that ultimately came to fruition after a moment, a moment in the Holocaust in which the extreme precariousness of Jewish life without a state had been illustrated in the most horrific way possible. And so if you want to talk and have a, and be convincing to Zionists and, and Zionist Jews, you, you're gonna, not going to be very convincing unless you actually listen and understand the way they have been taught and what their family experience has led them to believe about this. And that's why I think the dialogue is valuable both ways. Um, I'm going to, uh, great, thank you. I'm, I'm going to read a quote from, um, from Jewish Currents last July, just to um, ask you to elaborate on it a little bit. And I, I also, I think I have a question about it. Um, you wrote, in mainstream American discourse, the word anti-Palestinian barely exists. It is absent not because anti-Palestinian bigotry is rare, but because it is ubiquitous. It is absent precisely because if the concept existed, almost everyone in Congress would be guilty of it, except for a tiny minority of renegade progressives who are regularly denounced as anti-Semites. So I thought those were powerful words and would ask you to elaborate on them and I guess take be accountable for them, sort of justify them. But I also, uh, uh, sort of question related is it was very interesting to me that you picked out um, anti-Palestinian as a, as a word. I mean, that was a powerful thing to do. As, as opposed to anti-Arab or anti-Muslim, obviously those things are different, although there's an overlap. So I'm curious about your terminology and why you chose that. Yeah, yeah I mean, look, I, I believe um, deeply in the importance of, of talking about and combating anti-Semitism, not just morally, but you know, from a position of self-interest, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I walk through the streets of New York you know, many days of the week wearing a kippah. So I have a self-interest in, um, in, in, in um, there being less anti-Semitism. But um, one of the things that does bother me is, and it's not that we talk about anti-Semitism too much in my view, but we talk about anti-Palestinianism almost not at all, which is to say there are two parties, there are two nations in this conflict that are being talked about constantly, right? Um, and, um, and yet there's so little recognition that, um, that Palestinians also have the right to not be the subjects of bigotry. Um, and, and, and that Palestinians are a distinct national group, that they're not, uh, Islamophobia is a, is a different thing. Some, many Palestinians are Muslims, not all Palestinians are Muslims, right? Anti, even anti-Arab bigotry, most Palestinians are, are Arabs, but most Arabs are not Palestinians. This is a particular national group with a particular history. And it also happens to be a population um, who, um, who lack in various different ways, 
basic rights. The Palestinians who live in the West Bank and, the, and most in East Jerusalem live under the control of the Israeli state, but they are not citizens of the Israeli state. They can't vote for the government that controls their lives. They, need, they live under military law while their Jewish neighbors live under civil law. Their Jewish neighbors have free movement. They need, a, they need the permission of the Israeli military to travel around. These, it seems to me, by any reasonable definition, the, this is institutionalized bigotry, right? When you have two populations in one territory and you treat them differently ba because it be based on based on their ethnicity and religion, this is not a, this is not a subtle form of bigotry. It's an explicit, overt form of bigotry which exists for millions of people, uh, has existed since 1967, and in different ways. Even Palestinian citizens of Israel, which we which we talk about, which we can talk about, that are, are have a have a second class citizenship in which they experience institutionalized bigotry in, in very, very profound ways, not to mention the Palestinians who were made refugees, who were forced out of their homes, right, and cannot return. That's also, and, and you know, who cannot return because they're a Palestinian, right? Even, even as a Jew like me can go and go and become a citizen on Israel of day one. And the vast, virtually all the Republicans in Congress um, um, enthusiastically support this state of affairs. Right. Um, um, and in fact, many, many Democrats in Congress offend, essentially support it. Some of them might say in the abstract that they support a Palestinian state, but really almost none, very few of them are willing to actually do anything to bring that about, for instance, by conditioning American military aid on it and to settlement growth. And, there, and the number of Palestinians, the number of members of Congress who actually support the idea of equality under the law for all people in the territory that Israel now controls, which is supposedly the principle that we aspire to in the United States, is vanishingly small, right? I mean, you could count them on one hand. So what I was trying to do in the article is saying that if you take the idea of anti-Palestinianism seriously, as seriously as we take the idea of anti-Semitism, then you have a lot of people who have some answering to do, right? And that we should do that because Bigotry against Jews is not worse than bigotry against Palestinians, right? Bigotry against Jews is not terrible because Jews are, are, are any different than other people. It's terrible because everybody deserves to be treated equally, Palestinians as much as Jews. And yet that assumption does not tend to guide, I think, the conversation uh, in the United States. So, you know, when I asked the question, thank you for that answer. When I asked the question, you, um, one of the first things you did was to start lay out, lay out some facts about um, just a, a, a reminder, um, you know, that not all Palestinians are Muslims, that certainly most Arabs aren't Palestinians, that you started to lay out some facts. Um, and this, so this brings me to a different question, and it's really not necessarily in the, in the Palestinian, in the Israel-Palestinian um, context. But the, the question is really, what should we know about other uh, religions uh, as we, as we, here we are in a, in a religiously diverse world and even in a religiously diverse society. So what do we owe, what do we owe it to our fellow um, human beings to know about their, their religious experience? Um, and I'm focusing on religion for, because I think it's a good question to ask you, uh, because as you, as you mentioned earlier, or alluded to earlier, you're observant Jew. So it, particularly, what do you think people should know about Judaism and Jewry? Um, you know, what's the kind of core? And I know I mean, the yeah. answer can't be, it can't be a history of, yeah, yeah, <laughs> can't be a yeah. Um, history. Um, but some, some highlights of what we, uh, what we, uh, what we owe each other to know. Right. So I think first to say that I see the Israeli-Palestinian conflict much more fundamentally as a national conflict than right. as a religious conflict. Right. But, um, but that said, I think you're certainly right that I think one of the things that makes it sometimes challenge, that makes the conversation about Israel and Zionism and, and the Jewish community challenging is um, the distinctiveness of, of Judaism. So um, in that Judaism is a religion, um, um, uh, but the Jews are also a people, right? Um, in, the, in the, you know, in the story, the story of, of, in the book of Genesis, which Jews are reading now in the cycle of, um, uh, in our cycle of Torah reading, it tells the story, it starts with universal human beings, right? Adam and Eve, Noah, they're not, they're not Jews, they're universal people. Um, but then, then starting with actually with the Parsha that we will read, start, read, we will read on Saturday, Parsha Lech Lecha, you see with the story of, of Abraham, you see the story, this, then Genesis becomes a story of a family, 
And in the book of Exodus, that family becomes a nation, but a kind of nation in our people, a people imagined as a kind of extended family. We say B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. Israel is the name that Jacob is given after he wrestles with the angel. So there is a notion of a kind of, in some ways a central metaphor in, uh, in Judaism is the metaphor of family, that we are kind of like an extended family. And, and that creates this tension, which is one of the things I find most fascinating about Judaism and about being Jewish, between universalism and the particularism, which I think plays itself out differently than it does in Christianity or Islam, about which I'm not a scholar anyway, so I should avoid saying very much. But it seems to me that th th those religions don't have that same tension between, uh, between peoplehood and universal, um, and universal kind of in universal faith. And so one of the, the deep challenges, um, it seems to me, about being Jewish and about, about, about Judaism itself is this question of how we hold these two things. The, the particular story that we have as a people, with, which, which imposes particular special obligations that we have to one another, um, and, and religious obligations that Jews have. You know, according to Judaism, the, the, the Noahide laws, there are a set of principles that all people are supposed to, us, to abide by, right? But then Jews have a whole set of other separate laws, you know, many, many, many of them that are not, that we don't expect the rest of the world to, to abide by. And this tension between universalism and particularism seems to me as part of the genius of Judaism, but it's also what's very challenging about it. Um, um, and I I think a lot of the debates that one finds today among Jews, but between the Jew, but on the kind of the, the Jewish left and the Jewish right, have to do with where the right balance is here, between a universal moral ethic, a prophetic ethic, which which says, you know, we have a responsibility to care about all the human dignity of all people. After all, all people are created in the image of God, and the story of Torah doesn't start with Jews; it starts with human beings. Um, and this more particular sense that 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 says, um, uh, you know, um, that we have to, you know, that we have to look out for ourselves. It's very interesting that when Naftali Bennett came back from um, uh, from the White House from his first trip with Joe Biden, he met with some settlers in the West Bank. And um, they said, he said at one point, here's what I learned from my, from my trip to the West Bank. There's a, there's a famous, famous line, you know, attributed to uh, uh, Rabbi Hillel, who says, you know, um, if I am, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? Um, but if I'm only for myself, what am I? You know, not who am I, but what am I? It says that you become less human. And Bennett says, the thing I learned going to the White House is if I am not for myself, who will be for me? So it's just a fascinating window into his perspective on the world. That's what he learned, right? When I look at Naftali Bennett, I think, gosh, you know, it seems to me you have some work to do on the other side, on the second half of that, because you were the prime minister of a country that's holding millions and millions of people with fewer legal rights than a, an African-American in Mississippi under Jim Crow. Um, but of course, there's the ideological divide between the two of us. Great, thanks. And I, just, to, just to be clear, the reason, yeah, I, I didn't really ask my question in, in the light of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but more right, because we're because we're an educational institution, and so yes, one thing we might yes. do is have dialogue, which we talked yes. about earlier. But the other thing is we might try to make sure that people know what they need to know. And yes. so I thought you did you gamely rose to the occasion and said <laughs> some, some core things that you think people should know about Jews. In this case, um, relevant too to the to the political conflict. So that was great. Um, um, so. Um, Let's let's segue a little to Middle Eastern politics because you know we've only talked about easy things so far. So um, <laughs> one of the things you're you're pretty well known for is is moving moving away from your previous embrace of the of the two state solution. In any case, you've you've had an let me let you characterize your own view, but you've you've had an evolving view on Israel Palestine on the on the conflict, and I just want you to have a chance to talk about what your view is right now and how you got there. Thanks. So, I mean, it, it goes back to the last question, really, which is for me, the question is, I've always felt like I was wrestling with this question of balancing my particular obligations to my people, um, uh, uh, the Jewish people, um, and um, the universal moral obligations um, that I um, feel as a human being and as a Jew towards um, uh, towards Palestinians who, who lack basic freedoms that, that they deserve. And I for a long time thought that the way of balancing that would be through partition, um, a Jewish state, which would uh, have a special responsibility for Jewish um, self-expression and Jewish safety um, uh, in a, you know, a post-Holocaust world um, uh, where it seemed risky not to have such a state um, and, Palestinian, and, Pal and, and, a, and a Palestinian state. Um, and for um, where Palestinians would also have their own 
right to um, to, to sovereignty and self determination. Um, um, I think that the the and I spent about a decade uh, or so, you know, um, writing a lot about that and and um, um, and arguing that if we wanted that to be possible that our that that the Ameri that organized American Jewish American Jewish organizations and the American government needed to pursue a different policy towards Israel because Israel's policies were on a kind of automatic pilot in which the Israeli government was not only allowing Israeli Jews to move into the West Bank, but actually paying them to move into the West Bank by subsidizing, making it cheaper to live in the West Bank in a whole series of ways. And I wanna be clear, I have no problem whatsoever with Jews living in the West Bank. The problem is that they're moving into a territory where they, where they have citizenship at basic rights and, and their Palestinian neighbors have none, and they're making impossible, therefore, the state is, that's doing that is making impossible the possibility of the creation of a Palestinian state. And so you can't, and if Palestinians can't become citizens of their own country, what country are they going to become citizens of? Since it's a fundamental human right, it seems to me, to be a citizen of at least one country, um, the country that you're in. Um, um, but I, over time, I began to, um, uh, and it partly came out of conversations with Palestinian friends and colleagues, and you know, to to force to say I have to reckon with the possibility that this is no longer possible. Um, and kind of what happens then? Um, it becomes dangerous to hold out something. The danger is that it, that calling holding this out as a as a vision in the future becomes a kind of an excuse for simply in the at, supporting the status quo. You know, the, yes, in the in the in the in the distant future, but ultimately you become then an apologist for what's happening now, which is morally unacceptable. And and more deeply, um, and and more heretically, I I, I began to question not only the the, the feasibility, but also the morality of this notion of partition, because the no, this notion of partition requires, as conventionally understood, requires telling Palestinian refugees that they can't return to, to their home, to, to the places where, from which they came inside what's now Israel, because that would imperil Israel's demographic uh, majority. So it, it requires this language of maintaining a demographic majority, uh, a language that I think in other contexts we would, you know, in the United States context, for instance, we'd find very, very uncomfortable, right? Um, um, and it requires, it, it requires Jews of all people telling Palestinians, you know, we are people who for 2000 years prayed to return to this, to what we call the land of Israel, um, uh, never gave up, you know, feel immense pride in the sense that we never, we never abandoned or forgot this land, um, and then created this political movement in which many Jews did actually, even though their, their parents did not live there, their grandparents did not live there, their great grandparents lived there. And so who are, are we of all people going to tell Palestinians who were expelled from, from their homes 75 years ago that they or that their children or even their grandchildren cannot return? Do we think that Palestinians have less of an ability to cultivate a memory, less of a love of the place that they were from than we do. Um, and so I began to feel that ultimately um, the, the problem with partition was not only a question of feasibility, it was also a question of, of morality um, and that morally um, the, the, the Palestinians have the right to return. Um, uh, should have the right to return, and also that Palestinians should have the right to live in equality, and that Palestinians, citizens of Israel, even though they do have citizenship, these are the Palestinians who live within inside, is, inside Israel's original uh, uh, boundaries up until before the 1967 war, that they have the right to be equal citizens, not second-class citizens, that a Palestinian should be able to say to their kid, you can grow up to be the prime minister of this country, um, uh, which you can't do in a Jewish state. You can't do in a state that explicitly says, essentially, Jews have we privilege Jews over non-Jews in this country, which Israel does in many, many, many ways, even inside the Green Line, which we should get into. And that's what led me to think: Is it conceivable that 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 one equal state in all the territory that Israel now controls that this could be made to work? Um, and that was what ultimately led me to write this essay. I don't claim um, uh, that I can say with any, with absolute certainty, that one equal state would not have uh, would not have tremendous challenges. But I ultimately believe that those challenges would be less 
um, uh, than, than Israel controlling millions of people who lack basic rights. And ultimately, that ultimately would be, I think, ultimately, actually, a more secure long-term solution, even than partition, even if partition were possible, which I think it no longer is anymore. It, on, building on that last uh, yeah. sentence or two, I'm, I'm wondering if you have a a kind of positive vision or a vision of hope for what this other kind of entity would be if it's not a two-state solution and it's not the status quo, or if it's all, because most of what you said until the last sentence or two was about why a partition was, um, and why the status quo and partition were both morally unacceptable, but it, yeah. I didn't get a um, an inspiring vision of an alternative. And I, so, maybe there isn't one. If there isn't, that's okay I, too, but I, I just wonder. To imagine this alternative, I think uh, we have to imagine, um, a pretty dramatic shift in consciousness from what exists today. But um, because the vast majority of Israeli Jews today um, would not want to live um, in, in one equal state. The mo mo many Israeli Jews are comfortable living in the one state that exists today, where Israel controls in some form or another all the land between the Mediterranean uh, Sea and the Jordan River and millions of Palestinians uh, are stateless non-citizens. But, but, but only, um, uh, but, but, but it's only a small minority who support the idea of equality in one state. But we have seen historically, and this is um, that great m movements for freedom, great kind of moral movements can make things that in one moment look politically impossible look, become possible. I mean, I think if you'd asked many Americans in the 19, even as late as the 1940s, could they imagine in their lifetime that in the US Army, that a, a white man from Alabama would take orders from a black man from Alabama, they would have found that virtually impossible to imagine. Um, I, I, in, in South Africa, as late as the mid, even late 1980s, the notion that there could be a, a peaceful, nonviolent transition to a, to a government, a democratic government with Nelson Mandela as, as president would have been, for most white South Africans, inconceivable. Um, I think that um, what political science literature suggests, as I read it, is that in deeply divided societies, which Israel-Palestine is, those societies are actually more stable and more peaceful when everyone is represented in government. They are more violent and more unstable when one group is excluded from government. And I think, so, so if you look, take the example, and so I think that while um, uh, for many Jews, Israeli and diaspora Jews, the notion of equality leads them to think about Palestinians being empowered to, to kill Jews, to, to have, to, 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 to exile Jews, to do terrible, terrible things. I think if one looks comparatively and you, you, look, at it, you look at a situation like let's say Northern Ireland, right? Um, where the Irish Republican army was launching bombs all over, um, all over the United Kingdom, right? Um, when Catholics didn't have access to political, didn't have political equality with Protestants. Once, pa once pa Catholics in Northern Ireland gained political equality, the, the appetite for the IRA to commit these acts of violence dramatically dropped. Why it's not that complicated because Catholics in Northern Ireland had a nonviolent mechanism to express their interests and have the government represent them, right? You know, people tend to romanticize in certain kind of ways Nelson Mandela in the African National Congress. Nelson Mandela was not an apostle of nonviolence. Nelson Mandela was one of the people who turned the ANC in the early 1960s to support armed struggle. And he refused, with the, the South African government came to him in the 1980s repeatedly and said, we want to let you out of prison. We only had only on one condition, renounce violence. And he said, no. He said, I will, we will renounce violence and disarm when we have the date for a free election. And, but, but Mkonti Wasizwe, the military wing of the ANC, didn't continue its armed struggle once Black South Africans had the right to vote. Because most people, in, Palestinians included, I think, actually would much rather be able to express themselves politically in a way that doesn't endanger their lives or endanger the lives of other people. So a binational state, which is what this would be, would not be an easy thing. But we do have, it seems to me, if you look at Belgium, for instance, or, or Northern Ireland, you have examples of binational state, even Canada in certain ways, binational states that have basic foundation of individual rights. You need a very strong bill of rights, but also whether you call it consociational democracy, also have various mechanisms to make sure that neither group has its interests um, uh, overridden. So you might say that, for instance, for constitutional change, you might require that you have the buy-in of, of both communities at some significant level. And I think those would be the kind of protections you would need to build. And to people who say, this kind of one state is too dangerous, I would say, 
I think it's much less dangerous um, and also much less immoral than the one state that we have now, which is one state in which Palestinians really, uh, uh, in which Palestinians are locked out of political power treated without, you know, sub, uh, subjected to really brutal oppression. And that oppression is itself a form of violence. It may not be violence that we see on our front pages all the day, all the time, but if you spend any time with Palestinians in the West Bank or in other places, you see that lacking basic rights is the is experienced as a form of state violence. And that state violence seems to me sooner or later produces its own response, which is more violence. And that's why I believe that ultimately that equality in one state is a better bet for both Palestinians and Jews. Great, thanks. So it's getting to be time to uh, turn things over to the to the audience to have questions and actually our uh, comrade will, will ask those. I, I'm gonna actually, um, I just noticed something though and I, I'm gonna um, take the privilege of, since I, the video works for me and I'm speaking, I, I'm gonna, give you a question that comes from, from Alan Solomon, a former Dean of Tisch College and my friend and also the person for whom this lecture is um, named. So it just seems like he ought to be able to ask a question here. And I'm not, uh, it's, he did it um, through chat. So he, he asks, can you talk about organizations in the American Jewish community that are working for a peaceful resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, lest you get the impression that none of them are. So yes. I, I'm gonna yes. throw that question at you and then disappear and, and we'll turn things over to Kamran to to great. Questions. Alan is a, is, a, is a friend and I'm a great admirer of, of all the work he's done at Tufts and um, uh, now in his, his new role at J Street. Um, so, so yes, and, and I, I'm sorry if I, if I left that impression. I, I think that there, um, uh, so one organization is, is J Street, um, which um, although J Street and I do not, J Street supports two states and partition, it doesn't support um, my view of one equal state. So we have a friendly disagreement there, but I think what J Street has done is it has created a base inside the American Jewish community um, and inside Congress for people who don't um, uh, for people who don't believe that is it um, that the United States should simply support the Israeli government unconditionally, um, and I think that's really really important. Um, I, I also another um, there's there are other groups as well, um, if not now, um, a Jewish Voice for Peace, other American Jewish groups that all have different perspectives in different ways, but I think all of which share a basic moral belief that, that it is fundamentally wrong to deny Palestinians basic rights. Um, and another organization that I want to mention um, is an organization called Encounter, um, which is not that well known, but I um, uh, is doing something very important, which is it takes American Jews into the West Bank to spend time with Palestinians. And I, I think that the impact of that of, of actually seeing for, your, for yourself and hearing for yourself what it's like for people who've lived their entire lives without the most basic rights that we take for granted, that that experience has the capacity to produce tremendous change uh, inside, uh, inside among American Jews and, and among other Americans. I mean, I, I, I deeply, deeply wish that all members of Congress, instead of only going on the trip that APAC takes them, um, would also go and actually have a significant interaction with Palestinians, because I think that interaction can really change people's hearts in a profound way. Okay, hey, that's wonderful. We're getting a lot of great questions being posed uh, in the Q&A, so I'll just, uh, I'm gonna try to follow them in the order that they're sent. Um, some people are asking more than one, so we might just try to distill them. Uh, but the first question that I'll raise is uh, from David Kaplan. He asks, uh, it's likely that many writers and influencers passionately agree with you on Israel-Palestine and the occupation, but they keep it to themselves. Do you see more people speaking out anytime soon? Um, can you hear me? Hi, I'm sorry. Was there? Did, did you hear the question? Uh, I uh, no, I had an internet issue for a second. I, I just okay, switched no. to a different. Um, but now I can hear you. So my my apologies. Excellent, excellent. Okay, no, I was wondering. Okay, so the question was from uh, David Kaplan, and he asks that it's likely that many writers and influencers passionately agree with you on Israel and Palestine and the occupation, but they keep it to themselves. Do you see more people speaking out anytime soon? Um. I, I, I do think that, um, I mean, I think that there is a, um, in the, among American Jews, um, uh, I think that you see the, a generational divide. Um, um, outside of the Orthodox community, you see a generational divide in which I think younger American Jews on average are 
are, feel are more willing to be critical of Israel's behaviors. There's also um, a divide based on religious observance. Again, some of the used to kind of parallel to what you see among American Christians, which is that um, American Jews who are more religiously observant tend to be more, um, uh, more kind of unconditionally pro-Israeli government, whereas those who are more secular tend to be less so. Um, I, I think, I don't wanna suggest that there aren't lots and lots of people, um, uh, both American Jews and American Christians and others who from a place of deep, deep conviction support the policies of the Israeli government, support the existence of a Jewish state. There are, there are lots of those people um, who believe, them in, believe that in, in good faith. And I, I'm always grateful when I have the chance to talk to them. But I also think that there are political pressures that exist both inside the organized American Jewish community and also inside American politics um, that inhibit people from asking difficult questions and, and, and thinking for themselves sometimes on these issues. I mean, I think if you just look at the, the basic, put, put aside the Republican Party for a second, which seems to be largely digging in on the idea of making it uh, making America less democratic. But if you look at most Democrats who, who speak really passionately about the idea of that everyone in America should have the right to vote, that everyone should be treated equally under the law, that we should move towards being a, um, an anti-racist society, that we should try to fight against structural racism. Um, if you just take those principles and you apply them to Israel-Palestine, I just don't see how you can square that with unconditional US military aid, which, in, which includes money, American US dollars that can be used to do things like put Palestinian children in indefinite detention in the West Bank or, um, or uh, you know, demolish Palestinian homes when the only offense committed by those Palestinians is they didn't get a building permit that as non-citizens, as stateless non-citizens, they can really never ever get. Um, it seems to me, so I do think there is a real discrepancy um, between the, the political opinions that sometimes, again, particularly people who are, who are progressive um, uh, express when it comes to the US or in sometimes other countries and, and they express. And I do think that does have to do with political pressures that exist. And one of the things that frustrates me is that while I think, you know, bringing it back to anti-Semitism, while combat, combating anti-Semitism is, is essential, um, I, I, um, um, I do, it does bother me a lot when People use the 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 the, the allegation of anti-Semitism um, in order to uh, kind of inhibit people from actually raising fundamental questions and 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 making a claim about Palestinian rights. I mean, there is something it seems to me fundamentally perverse. If if the problem with anti-Semitism is that bigotry is wrong, then it seems to me to use uh, allegations of anti-Semitism to prevent people from struggling against anti-Palestinian bigotry, it seems to me is morally perverse. And yet I think that happens a lot of the time is that people who, who, who argue for Palestinian rights, even if they are absolutely explicit, that they believe that Jews should have all of the same rights, that Jews should be able to live safely with freedom and dignity in Israel, Palestine, that those people get called anti-Semites. Um, and, and that's a serious charge. I mean, you know, um, given the history of the 20th century as it should be. And, and it, it really bothers me um, when that charge is trivialized and weaponized in that way. Thank you. Um, the next uh, question I think is responding to uh, uh, something that you said in response to an earlier question uh, about dialogue. Um, so Leila Skinner, a student here at Tufts writes, is it possible to have dialogue when it requires even standing, which is impossible when there's an incredible power difference and an occupation and a situation of oppression? Uh, she goes on to say, can you have a dialogue between white nationalists and black Americans? Um, I think that, um, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's a mistake to simply um, uh, um, uh, assume that all Jews who come into this conversation or all Jews who define themselves as political Zionists are the equivalent of white nationalists. Um, uh, um, the, 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 that's not going, at, at, at the very least, that's not going to be the way that most of those Jews see it themselves. And, and I think that's why, um, um, and I think that's why the, the, the analogy to me is problematic, even though I think it's certainly, I do believe that Israel is a state in which Jews have 
uh, which operates on a kind of Jewish supremacy um, over Palestinians. I think that's true, but I don't think that's, I, I think that to go, to move from there to assume that, that Jews, Jews who are political Zionists see themselves as Jewish supremacists, I don't think that's how many of them see them. And I think that see themselves, and I think that's part of the importance of the dialogue. I think that the question of how one acknowledges power dynamics um, and yet has this still has this conversation is a really, really important question. It's not a question um, uh, unique to this. It's also something that will come up if, if, if black and white students are talking, if male and female students are talking, if, if you know, straight uh, students are talking and to LGBT. It, and I think that there are, there are thoughtful people who work in this space, I think who have found ways to both encourage dialogue and also name the power dynamics that exist in those spaces. And it seems to me that's what one has to try to do at the same time, ultimately with the goal of it not just being dialogue for dialogue's sake, but dialogue that produces a moral understanding um, uh, and, a, and, a, and, an, and, and an empathy and, and even a solidarity that produces change. Again, when I think about um, the work of Encounter, which is an organization that I, whose work I really believe in, um, uh, I, I, they, I can understand that it's not necessarily easy for Palestinians to, to, to talk about very traumatic and difficult things with the, with the Jews who come to meet with them. But I think that there's actually real evidence that doing that actually can have a practical fundamental change um, in, and it can make people do things differently, things that I think ultimately can contribute to the struggle for Palestinian freedom. Thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna move over to a, a somewhat more contentious question, um, but also quite broadly phrased. So um, feel free to narrow it if you'd like, but Greg Russo writes, uh, what responsibility do you place on the Palestinians for their current situation? Um, that's a great question. So there, there are lots of different Palestinians, right? Um, um, and so I think one has to kind of narrow that down a little bit. Um, I would say um, uh, if one is looking at, at Hamas, um, I think that um, the fact that Hamas wrote a charter in 1988 that was clearly an anti-Semitic document um, was, um, was, was really, really terrible. Um, I think it's just morally unacceptable to put out a document which quotes the protocols of the elders of Zion. Um, and I also think it hurt, uh, I think it hurt the Palestinian cause. Um, now Hamas, uh, Hamas in 2017 put out a new charter, um, but I think that the, um, I, I think that, uh, I think that was one way in which the Palestinian cause was harmed. Um, I also think that the, um, the use of, of, of violence, particularly against civilians in the second intifada um, was um, was was not was morally unacceptable in my view morally uh, and also was um, I think was counterproductive in a very different way I think the Palestinian Authority uh, is, is is currently hurting the Palestinian cause because the Palestinian Authority is essentially collaborating with the Israeli government um, serving as its subcontractor repressing Palestinians um, who either protest against the Palestinian authorities, uh, authoritarian dictatorial tendencies, or even who protest against Israel's undemocratic brutal control. And so it seems to me that actually the Palestinian authority is making it much easier for Israel at lower cost to control millions of Palestinians who lack basic rights because it's become a kind of self-interested entity that is benefiting. I mean, it's true, a lot of, it pays a lot of people salaries, but ultimately it seems to me it's, also, it's not actually serving the cause of Palestinian freedom as it, as it looks to me. So um, I don't think Palestinians are angels or perfect people. I don't think any group of people are. I think that in any freedom movement of any movement of people who lack basic rights, you will find a, a range of how people express themselves, some of which one, you know, some of which one will can applaud and some of which one might find kind of dismaying. But I, I also, but I want to make two points that I think are important here. First of all, there is a, to go back, there's a massive power imbalance, right? So this is not a situation in which you have two equal entities, like two governments, right? Israel massively control, has massively much more power than Palestinians. Israel can create facts on the ground in a way that Palestinians can't, right? So while I do think that, there, that it is, one has the right and even the obligation to have a moral criticism of a subjugated people, I don't think it means that people, because you don't have rights, you're 
off limits from any criticism, one has to keep that power in balance in mind. And the second thing, and I think this is something that shouldn't need to be said, but unfortunately often is need to be said in this conversation, which is that Palestinians don't need to be angels in order to deserve basic rights, right? I mean, people deserve basic human rights, um, fundamentally the right to be a citizen of the country in which they live, the right to live under the same legal system of people of a different, of their neighbors of a different race, religion, ethnicity, even if they're not even if they're fallible, flawed human beings, as we all are. And what frustrates me in the Israel-Palestine conversation is, let's say there's an incident in which uh, there's some act of Palestinian violence that, um, it, that, that I would consider just deplorable, that people will then use that as a reason to say, well, therefore, the pa Palestinians don't deserve their own state, which is a way of saying they don't deserve basic rights. I mean, if someone in Hong Kong, right, let's would say, shoots a Chinese policeman, I would say that's terrible. I don't want them to shoot a Chinese policeman, but it wouldn't lead me at all to say that the struggle of people in Hong Kong for basic human rights is illegitimate, right? Um, and I think that is the equation that I often, that I see made in American political discussion too often. So um, moving to another question from one of our students, uh, Sophia Friedman asks, what advice do you have for students who find themselves alienated by both pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian students for being too, quote unquote, the other side? Um, I guess I would say um, um, try to work through that alienation um, in a way that doesn't, that doesn't lead you to close um, to close yourself off from learning, you know, that, that um, still be willing to listen to people whose points of view you disagree with. Um, I think the alternative is to either absent yourself from the conversation. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate. I think that all Americans, given that America is Israel's largest military benefactor, given that Israel is America's largest diplomatic protector, that we are implicated, all Americans, in what Israel does, because it's doing it in part with American dollars. I mean, when people in Ga people in Gaza can see this, if they when they see that the you know the bombs or the missiles that are that are destroying buildings in Gaza, they can see that these are in many cases American weaponry. So we might think we can we can you can absence it yourself from this, but you can't because your government is actually involving you. Um, and so I would say for all Americans, and maybe for Jewish Americans in a different way because the organizations that claim to represent us, um, the, the, ten, the claim to speak for American Jewry, take a, tend to take a, a, a position in which they want to perpetuate this unconditional American support for Israel. I think those are reasons that, that, that one should be engaged and that, that, um, uh, that I think it's, if, if one finds what people are saying alienating, I think one should should question them, but I think that ultimately you're much more likely to be able to act in a kind of moral and a moral way on this subject if you can get past that alienation and still listen to people who have different points of view than you do. Great. Um, just because I'm seeing a few questions coming up on BDS, I thought that, and it's not something that you had an opportunity to speak about, I think at length as a discrete topic, maybe um, we'll take these all together. Um, one writes, uh, Harris Gordon writes, as a white Jewish South African who saw the success of sanctions and bringing down the apartheid regime, do you support BDS? Um, Mohsen al Atiri has written two questions. One is, is the BDS movement anti Semitic? And he also asked your opinion on Sally Rooney. So that might be a little bit of a digression. Mm -hmm. um, another asks, do you think BDS would be effective at giving leverage to the Palestinian struggle, or it would only make Israeli authorities and political Zionists feel more isolated and embattled? and double down and be more stu stubborn about compromise. Um, I think maybe all of this. Uh, sure, sure, there's a lot there. So I do not think the BDS movement is in, the movement the movement to boycott, divest and sanction uh, Israel is inherently anti-Semitic. Um, there, there, I'm sure there are people who are involved in the BDS movement who may themselves have done anti-Semitic things, um, but I don't think there's anything inherent in the, the BDS movement has three principles. It says they're basically gonna boycott, divest from and sanction Israel until Israel leaves the territories that it took in 1967, which are East Jerusalem, the West Bank, Gaza, and, and also the Golan Heights, um, that Israel will um, 
that there will be a, a refugee, ref, Palestinian refugee return as called for in United Nations resolutions, and that there will be equality for Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, uh, one can argue about those views, if one uh, those positions, if one, uh, uh, but it, I do not see anything anti-Semitic in those three principles. Um, uh, and, and actually one of the things that frustrates me, frankly, is that oftentimes I feel like the conversation about BDS that I hear often makes never makes reference to what actually the, the goals of the BDS movement are as stated in its own, in its own original call back in 2005. Um, um, the BDS, it's also important to know the BDS movement is a nonviolent movement. Um, uh, you know, so people who say that they don't want Palestinians to resist violently, um, uh, it seems to me need to, to think about um, uh, their um, um, whether they're willing to give Palestinians any credit when they actually um, when they actually resist nonviolently, and that also the BDS movement is a movement that speaks in the language of human rights and international law. Unlike Hamas, for instance, it's not an Islam. Movement. It's not a movement that comes out of a particular. Uh, it, it, um, it's a secular. It's a secular movement. Um, um, I so um, the on the question of um, that said, the BDS movement has lots and lots of different. different campaigns and different elements to it. And so I don't feel comfortable endorsing the unity of the BDS movement uh, as a blanket statement. Um, what I do feel comfortable doing is, um, uh, is, is, is supporting certain kinds of particular pressure on Israel um, that I believe would be effective. Um, and um, and that, uh, that feels to me um, uh, that I feel like I can full throatedly defend. And so for instance, chief among those would be the question of US military aid. Uh, in which I do not believe that the United, and so this would be a, a form of, of pressure on Israel um, that, I, that, that seems to me really, really important. That, that military aid is very, very important. Uh, and it seems to me um, that one of the things the US has done by giving military aid unconditionally to Israel um, and what America has done by shielding Israel from all forms of diplomatic or institutional pressure by preventing resolutions at the UN Security Council, by preventing Palestinians from taking Israel to the International Criminal Court. What America has done perversely is it has actually strengthened the, the most racist and reactionary elements in Israel. Because if you look at the internal debate inside Israeli politics, what the Israeli center or center left was, has been, was saying for many years to people like Netanyahu and Bennett was, we can't get away with this. There's gonna be a cost. If we continue to make the, if we make a Palestinian state impossible, we continue to act, maintain this brutal oppression, there are gonna be costs to us. And Netanyahu said, no, we can have our cake and eat it too. There will be no costs to us for doing this. And in fact, Netanyahu turned out to be right. There have been no costs. And a lot of the reason for that internationally is because of the role the US has played. And so I believe that I, I, I support conditioning military aid. I, so I do not support the US blocking all resolutions against Israel that were that are critical of Israel at the, in the UN or the, or the International Criminal Council, because I believe that actually a moral pressure, moral even loving pressure um, of the kind that you saw in uh, in the civil rights movement and other great movements for freedom, it's that kind of pressure that ultimately is going is the best chance of moving of moving towards greater freedom and and uh, uh, and equality for Palestinians. You know that Frederick Douglass famously said, "Power concedes nothing without a demand." There has to be a demand, um, and it seems to me if America shields Israel always from that, then Israel ultimately continues on, I think, the very dangerous and immoral status quo that it's on. So, um, so that would be, the, the, there are, those are the, that, when I think about the kinds of pressure that I support on Israel, it starts with, with American military aid, but also it continues um, uh, with, uh, with America not protecting Israel and in international institutions. And then when it comes to BDS, it really has to do with the particular BDS campaign. And I look at those individually. That's great. Um, I know that we've really taxed, uh, you know, um, we've taxed you with these questions. Our, our audience has also been very patient. I wonder if I might ask um, one more question, just bringing together a couple of questions. And I think it takes us back to the theme of your um, of your talk and the, the, actually the title of, of our event. Um, and then um, and then we can wrap up after that. So this will be the final um, question. Uh, and uh, I'm bringing together questions from my colleague and dear friend, uh, Margaret Litvin, uh, and another question from uh, Rachel Cole, both of whom uh, are raising questions about this, the, the role of American Jews. Uh, Margaret writes, um, might it already, already be too late for the US, including American Jews, uh, 
um, to influence Israel's behavior? Might Israel just be too strong for us and, and be able to write us off? And on the other side, Margaret Cole, or, I'm sorry, Rachel Cole asks, um, what do you say to Jewish Israelis who tell you that it's not your place to be involved in this topic because you're an American who does not live there? Okay. So let me answer the first one first. I mean, if I as an American don't have the right to hold a position and try to act on that position vis-a-vis -vis Israel, um, or vis-a-vis -vis Israeli policies, then I certainly also have no right to criticize the Palestinians, right? Because I don't live... If I don't live in, uh, you know, I don't live in Tel Aviv, I also don't live in Gaza City, nor do I have right, the right to criticize the government of Iran or the government of Syria or the government of China or anyway, I don't live in any of those places. Um, so it seems to me that's the moral principle. I, as a, I, I generally believe in the moral principle that we have the right to have moral views and to take moral actions based on position, places that we, don't, we in, in places we don't, we don't live. And so the, in fact, the American Jewish institutional Jewish community has very, very much believed in that principle. I mean, one of the great, I think, one of the, the, the one of the greatest movements that, that American Jewry has organized in the last half century was the movement for so movement for Soviet Jewry, right? American Jews didn't live in the Soviet Union, right? So what was their right to 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 boycott as they did boycott the Bolshoi Ballet, for instance, in order to put pressure on the Soviet government because we believed there was something that was morally wrong, which there was. Um, so that would be the first point. I also think that as I to go back to what I said earlier. It would be one thing if Israel didn't receive any American military aid um, and Israel didn't receive Israeli diplomatic protection and America really was not involved in this conflict, right? But America is deeply, deeply involved in this conflict, right? We play a very powerful role. We exacerbate the power dynamic between Israel and Palestinians in pretty profound ways. And so um, it seems to me if you wanna tell American Jews or any Americans not to be involved, um, then you should also say, we're not, we, don't want an America's, we don't want American taxpayer dollars and we don't want American diplomatic protection, leave us on, on our own. And I think that that would be a very, very different kind of proposition. Um, in terms of how much influence American Jews or, or Americans in general have, um, I, I think that, um, um, I don't think that there's likely to be any significant shift um, um, unless there is um, a kind of Palestinian resistance movement that, um, that, um, that, that emerges that it does not exist today uh, on the ground. Um, I deeply hope it's a, nonviolent movement um, that brings together Palestinians and calls for equality and freedom in a, in a moral language that makes clear that, 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 uh, that offers a vision of a shared society in which Jews and Palestinians live alongside one another with respect and equality together. Um, and, but also makes it clear that Palestinians will not accept um, uh, and will not collaborate with and will not make it easier for Israel to maintain uh, a control that denies them the most basic rights. Um, I think in the context of that kind of movement, obviously there are many, many things that are preventing that, the, 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 the division between Hamas and Fatah, um, the, 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 the control that Israel exercises. Um, 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 but, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm not a Palestinian. I don't live under those circumstances. So it's, it's not for me to sketch out how Palestinians should, should create that movement. But I do believe in the context of that kind of movement that we, will see, that we very likely could see a response in the United States that moves towards shifting American politics. We saw that a bit even this spring, that it's easy for Americans to turn away and not pay attention um, um, when, there's, when there's not a Palestinian movement that they can see that's actually resisting on the ground. But when there is such a movement, I think then um, it, it, I think it creates an atmosphere in the United States where more and more Americans become willing, including American Jews, to say, is it really, does it really accord with our values and our beliefs for us to endlessly resupply the Israeli military in an unconditional way when these are the things it's doing to a Palestinian population that lacks basic rights. So I think that um, in, if you look at the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, again, the, it's far from an exact parallel. There are, of course, there are lots of differences between Israel, Palestine, and South Africa that we could talk about. But I think one of the significant things to notice if one looks at what happened in the 1980s is that Pal the Black South Africans on the ground, led by the United Democratic Front, which was the African National Congress's kind of local, um, kind of local analog, 
created a movement on the ground that then echoed in the United States and around the world and fueled the anti-apartheid movement and ultimately led to the passage of sanctions by, by the US Congress. So that's the kind of thing that I would like to see happen uh, in Israel-Palestine as well. Okay, well, I, I, I do see that there are still a few questions that we're not able to cover. Um, and so I, I apologize to those who posed these, um, I think very interesting questions that we're not able to address here. Um, um, but I do, I want to wrap up by expressing my gratitude uh, to you, Peter Beinart, for taking this time and so generously engaging us uh, and also engaging us at, at Tufts um, more broadly. Uh, we're grateful that you came here in the middle of the pandemic and are speaking to us in person. It's, 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 uh, it's been quite a privilege. Um, to our audience, I would just say, please, uh, if you're not already signed on, um, sign up for our email lists, uh, the Tisch uh, uh, College for uh, Civic Life and um, the Center for the Humanities. Uh, look for our uh, future events on this uh, theme of uh, exploring anti-Semitism from a variety of uh, perspectives. And again, join me in thanking uh, Peter Beinart and Peter Levine uh, for a really engaging uh, event. Thank you.